It's a morning ritual in Iowa's capital city. The Des Moines Waterworks collects samples from the Raccoon River, the primary source of drinking water for half a million central Iowans. The surface water undergoes daily lab analysis to detect possible contaminants, and the data generated informs Waterworks officials on how to cleanse the crucial resource, making it safe for human consumption. But one contaminant, nitrates, are ubiquitous in Corn Belt waterways. Nitrates present a giant hurdle, one that has the municipal utility gearing up for unprecedented legal action. We're very confident that these are clear point source groundwater polluters that are coming from agricultural use. Waterworks CEO and general manager Bill Stowe is a controversial figure in central Iowa. At his request, the Des Moines Waterworks Board voted unanimously to issue a 60-day notice of intent to sue boards of supervisors in three northwest Iowa counties over high nitrate levels in the Raccoon. While Des Moines has battled high nitrate levels for decades, a surge in awareness and hints of courtroom solutions have increased dramatically during Stowe's tenure. Nevertheless, the threat of litigation broadsided leaders upstream in Sac, Calhoun, and Buena Vista counties. That's just not the Iowa way of doing things. Mr. Stowe says that they've been talking for 15 years, but I don't know who they were talking to. They certainly weren't talking with uh, anybody that they sued. Issued early in January, the notice of intent to sue identifies massive artificial subsurface drainage infrastructure as point source pollution in violation of state and federal law. Drainage districts under county jurisdiction are accused of allowing excess nutrients from farm runoff to flow downstream. And while agriculture is currently considered a source of non-point pollution, the pending lawsuit in Iowa ultimately could redefine such distinctions for farmers from sea to shining sea. Our goal in this rule is very straightforward, is to respond to requests from stakeholders across the country to make the process of identifying waters protected under the Clean Water Act easier to understand. With little success, several administrations have attempted to clarify regulatory authority of the Environmental Protection Agency under the Clean Water Act of 1972. And despite EPA actions, ranging from the banning of DDT to removing lead from gasoline, hemming and hawing over ditch and pond provisions for decades has fueled concerns of government overreach. Given its history of ignorance and indifference towards the needs of rural America, it's no wonder that EPA's assurances are met with skepticism by many in America, but particularly America's farmers. Under EPA regulations, municipally treated water can contain no more than 10 milligrams of nitrates per liter. And given the amount of nutrient required to grow corn, that can be a tall order in the Hawkeye State. To grow corn, we have to have nitrogen at the root zone at 40 parts per million. Nitrate pollution can pose significant health risks, especially to pregnant women and children less than six months of age. The microscopic ions actually develop through natural conversion processes of nitrogen, abundant in the air and present in the soil through common occurrences like plant decay and animal waste. Excess nitrogen from urban lawns contributes a share of nitrates, but experts say rural nitrogen application, as fertilizer, is responsible for most of the pollutant in Iowa's waterways. It's estimated globally that without the use of nitrogen to accelerate food production, only one of two people alive on the earth today would be alive. Now working in the private sector, Dean Lemke was a lead author of Iowa's nutrient reduction strategy before retiring from the Iowa Department of Agriculture. The state adopted the science-based plan in 2013, which recommends wetlands and bioreactors that slow down, capture, and digest nutrient flows. Lemke claims an average of 52% of nitrates entering such landscapes are removed. But sweeping results haven't come as quickly as some demand. When nitrate levels in its intake waterways spike consistently above legal limits, Des Moines Waterworks claims it has no choice but to operate what is believed to be the world's largest nitrate removal facility. 
The system costs up to $7,000 per day to run. When nitrate levels swelled in 2013, the price tag was nearly $1 million. Late last year, the utility again fired up its 25-year-old equipment, a rarity during the winter. The facility has been running 24-7 since December 4th, and officials offer no prediction as to when it can be turned off. And if things don't change upstream, Waterworks warns the aging machinery won't be able to keep up. Critics charge that even as the urban utility would reclassify rural drainage districts, it is a point source polluter itself. And though legal under its state permit, nitrates that Des Moines Waterworks removes for customers often end up right back in the river, threatening water standards for towns downstream from the capital. You know, that's a fair criticism at some level. Uh, everything has warts. That's certainly one of our largest warts. But here's the real issue. The nitrate cycle, the nitrogen cycle is very complicated. We did not introduce nitrogen into the system. The producers introduced new nitrogen into the system. We can't clean it quickly enough and deliver it other than to take it out and unfortunately have to put it back. As far as I'm concerned, he's, he's a bureaucrat looking for a cause that he can put regulations on that cannot be met so he can elevate himself. Public outcry at the proposed lawsuit prompted Iowa Secretary of Agriculture Bill Northey to hold a series of meetings this winter with citizens in each of the three counties named in the lawsuit. For the previous five years, the Des Moines Water Works didn't need to run that nitrogen reduction plant at all. And that doesn't mean that we had solved all the issues just because that plant didn't have to run. We have work that we need to do. The head of the Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship urged landowners to adopt voluntary measures to lower nitrate levels before drawn-out litigation gives way to widespread federal regulations. Some producers relayed the challenges they face protecting their livelihoods and the environment. I'd like to tell the people in Des Moines, one of the things I'd like to do is give you no nitrogen. I would like to give you no phosphorus. I would like it all to stay in my fields so that my plants utilize every bit of it. We're all about efficiencies, whether it be uh, fertility efficiencies or other parts of the management cycle. You know, we, we, want, we want to utilize 100% of our inputs all the time. We certainly wanted to make sure that they knew that there are a lot of folks across the state of Iowa that are supporting them, certainly a lot in state government, that we got their back. This is important for us to get right. When news broke of the 60-day notice, prominent voices weighed in quickly. U.S. Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack noted that implementing voluntary efforts to curb nutrients would be quicker than the legal wrangling of such a high-profile case. Iowa Governor Terry Branstad even went so far as to say that Des Moines has declared war on rural Iowa. The overall goal of the Iowa strategy is 45 percent nitrogen and phosphorus reduction, which parallels the goal for the Gulf of Mexico hypoxic zone. In addition to its own water woes, Iowa is a primary contributor to the dead zone, a seasonal formation of low oxygen waters in the Gulf of Mexico, which are incapable of supporting aquatic life. Conservation practices have been promoted for years to reduce pollution, and some see infield sanitation practices as the wave of the future and the best way to avoid intrusive government oversight. Stowe disagrees. I think of all of the environmental improvements that I've seen in my lifetime, whether it's ozone protection or phosphates out of detergents or lead out of gasoline, they've all come through regulation, not about voluntarily the producers removing them for the greater good. That's not the way the world's worked, and I think history bears that out. Last year, state legislators in Iowa recommended $25 million in continued funding for the Resource Enhancement and Protection Program. The quarter-century-old environmental program funds a host of water initiatives that get to the heart of the current predicament. But the governor vetoed the proposal, cutting over $11 million to Northey's department, a top promoter of the nutrient reduction strategy. Perhaps if some accountability measures were added to the strategy, it would reassure Iowans that our state's leadership was taking the strategy seriously. Advocacy groups applaud Lemke and others' work as a good step, but say a giant leap is what's needed. A strategy that doesn't have a timeline or any benchmarks or any consistent quality monitoring is not a goal that can be met. 
Lemke claims that documentation does exist for nearly every farm in Iowa through records kept by agricultural retailers. Accessing that information could help kickstart conservation projects. It's an active effort here to record that progress more meaningfully than we've been able to do in the past. As a legal showdown looms, Lemke admits voluntary conservation efforts are ultimately subject to economic realities. Without a doubt, today's economy in the Corn Belt is affected by low grain prices, and farmers are struggling to break even. That's not a good time to ask farmers to make major significant uh, investments uh, in environmental improvements. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner.